as we imagined, not all is okay for a franchise player to the point where he probably won't play any longer in the National Hockey League. One player had decided, that's it for me. I want to go somewhere else. All of a sudden, there might be a change of heart from him and his family. They're all going to be back. And one player promises that he'll bounce back. All your Habs coverage and more. I'm Marinero. It's Brunchin' with Marinero, the sick podcast. My guest today, Stu Cowan from the Montreal Gazette and Hockey Inside Out. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Tony Maradero. The Sickest Montreal Canadiens Podcast. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadiens win the Stanley Cup. Sports Entertainment. Like no other. Brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. Marinero, the sick podcast, brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Of course, intense by nature, indeed. The beer for those who follow their instinct and live their passions in order to make their mark the way I do and the way my buddy Stu Cowan does. It's Sunday afternoon. Hey, how you doing, Tony? Good. How are you? Very good, thanks. The end of the season. How do you feel? Are you tired? Are you drained? You're burnt out? What's going on now? You're probably more tired than I am because, of course, you follow the team on the road or you did down the stretch probably in the last month of the season. You attend pretty much every game at the Bell Center. I don't have to because I'm not a reporter and I don't write, but uh, tired? Uh, a little bit. Yesterday was a long day with the uh, the post-mortem uh, news conference in Brossard, but uh, Chantal McAvee did a fantastic job of uh, handling it like she has with everything else she's done since taking over that job. Things went smoothly. We got to speak to uh, the players that uh, we had requested for, with the exception of Shea Weber. But, um, yeah, a little tiring, but I want to thank Marty St. Louis for making the last part of the season at least tolerable because uh, before the coaching change, we're literally looking at the calendar going, oh, my God, I can't believe how many more games of this we need to watch before it ends. But at least Marty St. Louis made it interesting, and they were fun to watch down the stretch. You're right about that. Okay, speaking of Shea Weber, let's tackle it right out of the gate. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism of his uh, uh, lack of, of uh, speaking with the media this year. We thought he was going to be around more often than what he was. Uh, he was around at one point early on in the season um, when Mark Bergevin was relieved of his duties. He had been in town for a couple of days. He went to lunch with Bergevin the day after. He was in Seattle uh, with the players for a couple of days, and they went to a, um, a Seahawks football game. Uh, he was in Vancouver where he resides in Kelowna for the rookie dinner. And he was here for fan appreciation night, which was the final game of the regular season and probably for medicals as well. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism that he wasn't there on opening night. There's been a lot of criticism that he wasn't there on Guy Lafleur tribute night. And before we get to our respective opinions on it, um, or our respective opinions on it, why don't we hear from Kent Hughes, who was asked about uh, Shea Weber's um, lack of being around. Um, he was asked about it yesterday. Let's see what he had to say. All right. Okay. Uh, I I don't think we I don't think we have it. Uh, but um, let, why don't I? Uh, Kent Hughes basically said, "I don't think it's a, a lack of respect. It's no disrespect from Shea. He just wasn't comfortable talking to the media in the context that is." Translation. What does that mean to you, Stu? Well, Kent Hughes also said that Shea Weber likes to operate in the shadows, and it. It's sort of it's surprising the captain of the Canes wouldn't speak all season, but it's not surprising when you've been around Shea Weber, and which I have been since he came here, and he just he hates dealing with the media. He really doesn't like doing it. Yeah. And um, but you know, you mentioned earlier in the season he was in Seattle with the team, and it would have been the perfect opportunity to do ten or fifteen minutes with the media. It wouldn't have been the, all the media that's around when the team's at home. It would have been four or five guys that were on that road trip with the team, 10, 15 minutes, and. I don't see anything negative that would have been would have been all positive. It would have been like, how was he able to play as well as he did in the playoffs last season, despite all the injuries? 
and just I think fans just wanted to know how he's feeling, how he's doing. Um, um, just comments like that. If you can't talk about the actual injury and how it might impact his contract or what, you can just say I can't answer that question. But it's it's not surprising having been around Shea Weber, but um, it's I guess just this. I mean, it's disappointing that he wouldn't take 15 minutes to just let the fans know how he's doing. I think that's all that people really wanted. Yeah, Stu, I don't disagree with you. I've given my opinion on it. I know a lot of people don't agree with it, and that's fine. If you don't think he should have been there on opening night, and you don't think he should have been there on the night that they paid tribute to Guy Lafleur, you don't really grasp what the Montreal Canadiens mean, who they are, what they stand for, the long-standing tradition, the fact it's a culture, the fact it's part of the fabric of who we are uh, as a city, who they are as an organization. It's all about the passing of the torch. It's all about the example. And and um, I think I think he dropped the ball. I well, think Tony, he dropped the ball by not being there opening season. I think he dropped the ball by not being there the night they paid tribute to Guy Lafleur. Tony, if he had been there opening night, they would have blown the roof off the Bell Center with the ovation for him. This is the captain who led the team along with Carey Price to the Stanley Cup final. His yeah. best hockey he played during his entire time with the Canadians was in the playoffs last season. And, and people knew by that point the injuries he was going through. They knew he probably wasn't going to play this season. They knew his career might be over. And it would have been an amazing send-off for him. They would have blown the roof off. Instead, yeah. when he did come out for Pierre Gervais' night on uh, Friday night at the Bell Center, the reception was lukewarm at best, and there was a smattering of booze around. And it's just, yeah, I don't understand. Like, I, I know for the Canadian's PR department would have loved for him to speak, um, but he chose not to. And that's just Shea Weber. I don't think he, Shea Weber is one of those guys who does his own thing. I don't think he cares what anybody else thinks, yeah. whether it does or fans or anybody, he just does his own thing. And, and that's what he did. So, I mean, you no, know, people, like, as a, personally, I don't care if he talks to us or not. Um, no, it's his right to say I don't want to speak to the media. And like by the way, it's not about us talking to the yeah. media like you have said on numerous mm -hmm. occasions mm -hmm. is talking to the fans. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And by the way, change of plans by him, as I predicted there would be, by the way. I don't think I'm alone. Uh, but he was supposed to come in for a couple of days. Instead, he's going to be extending his visit because he's going to be attending Guy Lafleur's funeral. And Stu, you could just imagine... Uh, members of the Canadians organization, and we know how much of an influence Chantal is having. Mm -hmm. And Chantal has been around for a long time, grew up here, understands the culture and the tradition as good or better than anyone else. She understands it. She gets it. You would imagine or you would assume that they say, Shay, um, if you can, Shay, if you can, this is something very important to the organization, to the city and the fan base. And at that point, you would think that he got it for sure. And so he's going to be sticking around. He'll be at the funeral, as will many of his teammates. All right? Which I figured would happen, right? Yeah, Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield. It was sort of cool they brought them out together yesterday at the news conference. These guys are attached at the hip, it seems, right now. Yeah. Uh, they both said they're sticking around and they're going to go to the funeral. They said there'll be a group of uh, other players around. But I think you're right. I think Trey Weber's original plan was to come to town and leave. I mean, he had to be in town because they have the post, the end of season medicals, which every player must go through. So he had to be here for that. Uh, I think his original plan was to leave. And I think Chantal probably convinced him to stay. And look, I have nothing against personally against Trey Weber. I mean, I feel for but the, nobody guy, does. the way his career ended. I wish him all the best moving forward. I hope yeah. he can enjoy his retirement and be healthy enough to spend time with his wife and kids and his family. Um, I just find it surprising that, you know, he wouldn't have had like, 10, 15 minutes just to either thank the fans or just let the fans know how he was feeling. That's all. But no, Still, life goes on. I don't know this for a fact, what I'm going to say, but I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Everyone has their opinion on the trade. All right. I, I think the Canadians did well in the end. I don't have a problem with that. Having said that, and Shea Weber, by all accounts, was a great captain. Everything we've heard about him, leadership in the past, I don't doubt any of that. And he was an absolute beast, an absolute monster in the playoffs last year. He was amazing. Having said that, a guy like PK, who was never a captain, and even a guy who had an A, even a guy like Petretti, who was the captain, I'd be willing to bet 
that they would have been there on opening night, and I'd be willing to bet they would have been there on the night that they paid tribute to Gila Fleur. I don't know that because it didn't happen, but I'd be willing to bet that they would have. Yeah, I you know I can't really speak for Shea Weber, but I don't think he ever grasped the difference between being captain in Nashville and the difference between being captain here. In Nashville, when he was there, there was one beat reporter who covered the team, Adam Vinyan, who's now with uh, The Athletic. Yeah. Uh, but he never had to deal with the media. So I don't know why he dislikes the media so much. I don't think he – I mean, there was one guy in Nashville, and Adam's a good guy. I don't think he ever had a problem with him, and I don't know if he had a problem when he came here. I just think he just doesn't like talking. And, you know, I think, you know, remember Steve Carlton, the pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies. He never yeah. spoke to the media. He never wanted to. As I said, I'm part of the media. If a guy doesn't want to talk, that's his right. You can't force him to. Um, so, you know, Shades decided he didn't want to talk for whatever reasons. And we don't know what those reasons are because, you know, we haven't heard from all. Follow us on all social media platforms. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, subscribe. Because as soon as an episode is uploaded or it goes live, you will be notified on uh, on your tablet or on your phone or whatnot. And if you want to go back and you want to listen to our podcast, of course, you can do so via the iHeartRadio app. Okay, now, the big news on the day, we suspected it. Carey Price returned and only played five games in the regular season this year. He had lost the first four. His goals against average was over four. His save percentage was under 865. Until he won his final game of the regular season, and they won big on Friday night by a score of 10-2 to versus the Florida Panthers team who had clinched the President's Trophy the night before and pretty much didn't dress anybody. Now, having said that, he won. With less than 30 seconds to go in the game, he turns back. He looks over at his wife and kids while the play is going on. He salutes. He says hi and stuff like that. He said that he thought that the whistle had gone off, and they just to show that, he wasn't really in the game mentally, Stu. There's a lot going through his mind. And here's Price on his knee yesterday. Uh, I'm just continuing to get a lot of swelling in my knee. So, um, you know, due to that fact, it's uh, it's been difficult to do a lot of things that I would consider, you know, well out there. Um, you know, last night, for instance, it played pretty pretty well. You know, it was a pretty good game, but uh, in that same token, there's there's uh, different aspects of goaltending that's required these days that uh, is very difficult for me to do. So, um, like I said, we're just going to get uh, we're going to get us another opinion and uh, and go from there. Uh, on that note, Stu, uh, he did not um, dismiss the possibility of another surgery. It's something that is on the table. He was also asked, feeling the way he feels right now, does he see himself playing 55-plus games next season? He said that would not happen. Uh, definitely not. And he was also asked, did you approach this game versus Florida as if it could be the last game of your career playing in a 700th NHL regular season game? This is what he had to say to that, Stu. We're going to say to you, Estelle, this is... Maybe it. Did you prepare that way? Yeah. Um, you know, the whole day was, uh, it was just an exceptional day for myself. You know, it was just, uh, you know, from, uh, I had a great sleep. Just, it was just like uh, an A-plus day. So, um, you know, if it is it, then, you know, that would be a great way to do it. Stu, you listen to that. You're a fan of the Montreal Canadiens. You're probably thinking... This is it. Tony, it was a great answer. And we were talking about Chantal McAvee before, and, and Kerry's another guy who didn't never liked dealing with the media and usually said as few words as possible. And I think she's convinced him to just be open and honest. And what an open and honest answer that was, right? It was awesome. And, and you awesome. mentioned about him, you know, his mind maybe not being in the game when he was waving at his daughter. Uh, he, he said he thought the whistle went, I believe him, but it, understandably his mind wouldn't be 100% on the game at that point. They're up 10-2 or whatever it was at the time. Uh, he's realizing this might be his last game. I think one of the reasons he came back and played is his kids are at that age. His son's probably too little, but his daughters are at the age that they might remember. He wants them to remember him yeah. playing at the Bell Center for the Canadians. He said it's his identity. If Carey Price lives to be 100 years old, he'll always be known as the goalie for the Montreal Canadiens. That's who he is. And I think a big reason why he came back and a big reason why he played 
the final game of the season. There was no point to it, right? I mean, the chance of injuring his knee again is that he wanted his kids to have a memory of him playing. And he, as he said, he went through the day preparing as if it was his last game. And it was really refreshing just to hear Carey Price talk openly and honestly about what he was going through. And Chantal said when she took over this job, one of the things she wanted to do is let the fans fall in love with the players the way she fell in love with Guy Lafleur. And the only way, the best way to do that is just have the players let fans realize they're human. That despite all the money they make and all the fame they have, they're human. Carey Price is a dad. That was an emotional night for him. Uh, it really was. Um, we're going to get to all of your questions, by the way. So if you want to send them in, start sending them in now. Well, not all of your questions, but we'll try and get to as many as we can. And if you really love this podcast, not like it, but you really love it, just keep commenting sick, and that'll give us a pretty good idea how much you like it. All right, okay. Other things that took place yesterday, which was the final day, and the players were clearing out their lockers, and everyone had a chance to speak, including general manager Kent Hughes, coach Marty St. Louis, the players, and all of that. Uh, Marty St. Louis was asked about his status and the status of his assistants. Let's hear from him. Pas maintenant. Je suis content avec les gars que j'ai. Euh, puis euh, je vais continuer comme ça. J'ai, j'ai, j'ai confiance en <coughs> l'expérience de ces gars-là. Pas, euh, pas, pas juste sur le côté coaché, mais ça fait longtemps qu'ils sont dans le hockey. Puis ils ont joué récemment aussi. Puis je pense que c'est important. All right. So uh, if anyone was wondering if Marty St. Louis was going to be back, because Stu, I don't know about you, uh, and I would imagine you did. But at one point, uh, a lot of people whispered in our ears that, hey, not so sure Marty will be back next year. Not so sure with the family being in New York and him here. And he might not. Now, they didn't 100% say that he would be back yesterday, but they 100% said that he would be back, if that makes sense, right? Kent Hughes said it's not official. He expects it to be done very shortly. And Marty St. Louis said that he will be bringing back all of his assistant coaches because he was happy with the job that they did, happy with their experience, and happy with the fact that they're recently removed from the game. You would think he was talking about uh, Alex Burroughs and Trevor Lutowski uh, in that respect. So um, he's going to be back, and he's bringing back all his assistants. I'm not shocked that he's not bringing in one of his own guys, but I probably would have bet that he would have. Yeah, I, I thought he might also. And, you know, Ken Hughes even said he's hoping, ideally he'd like to sign Marty to a three-year contract moving forward, which makes sense for a guy, uh, you know, guy first, you know, rookie NHL uh, head coach. It's the same deal they give, or the same length of deal that they give uh, Dominic Ducharme. I mean, the only reason I thought he might not be back is maybe if he got an offer from a team closer to his family home in Connecticut. Uh, he was asked, yesterday if you know if he'll move his family to montreal and he said that's not the plan his wife and kids will stay in connecticut um kent hughes was asked if that can be a distraction for a coach not having his family there and he mentioned in some ways it can help because you know a coach is working 100 hours a week it's not like they're going home for supper every night and they're around um you know his wife can fly in and see him or drive in and see him and vice versa on time off it's not like wives and kids of uh nhl head coaches see them very often during the season no matter where they're living yeah uh, so Marty's, this was, you know, it was a learning process this year for your Jordan yeah. Harris and all the young players. It was a learning process also for Marty St. Louis. And I asked him yesterday, you know, what's the biggest lesson you learned? He came in here with no NHL head coaching experience. After his first game, he talked about how fast things were moving. And he said communication, but not communication with the players and his coaches. He says, I need to learn how to communicate better with the training staff and the medical staff. And, and so I realized how hard they work and I need to communicate with them better when it comes to scheduling and whatnot to try and make their jobs a little bit easier. So I think he came in here and he was focused so much on the players, so much on the hockey yeah. that now he's realized there's a lot more that's involved with being a head coach and everybody else you're dealing with. And they're going to be bringing in an analytics department and a lot of other things. And as Kent Hughes said, Marty's a really smart guy, a really good uh, communicator, which is keys to a modern NHL coach. And uh, that's why, I mean, this is going to be a development stage for this team for the next few years. And, and you know, uh, I think it was Jeff Petrie said yesterday, the guys are still uh, they're buying in 100% to what Marty St. Louis is selling. The v- rookies, yeah. the veterans, and whatnot. So moving forward, that's a, a big thing. Jordan Harris spoke this week about 
what a relief it was for him to have Marty when he first got called up say, you're going to make, you're going to have three or four plays every game you're going to want back. You're going to make, mis- don't worry about it. And he said, what a relief that was for him to know that if he makes those three or four mistakes in a game, he's still going to be back out there. He's still going to be playing. The St. Louis said, there's no such thing as a perfect game. The problem is if the player makes the same mistake over and over and over, then you have to deal with that. But no, nobody, as he said, nobody in the NHL ever plays a perfect game. The good news uh, for him, of course, is that he still has his dad here and he's got his sisters here and he does have family here. So, which yeah. probably makes it a little bit easier. Okay. Uh, we are going to get to more audio between now and the end of the show. We're going to hear from Jeff Petrie and we're going to hear from Brendan Gallagher, among others. But why don't we start taking some questions and we'll get to those uh, that audio a little bit later on. Just one, right. thing, one thing quick, though, I just want to add, we talked about Marty's dad. His dad's a hockey nut, right? Just like Marty. Yeah. So I'm sure he's enjoying being able to call his dad after the game or go visit him, maybe have a beer and just talk about things and bounce things off him. So that's yeah. uh, that's that's a pretty cool thing for him to have here. Question from Paul Savard for Stu Cowan. If Price retires, how does it affect the cap? He's not going to retire. I think there's too much money left on the table there. He's got about $32 million, and I think $24 million of it is in signing bonuses. I'd be shocked if he was to walk away from that much money. Um, I think, I think I'm it's more $42 like, million. Is it not 10.5 times 4? Well, it's no, because he's not. he only makes – he made $2 million, I think, in real salary this oh, year. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was front-loaded with bonuses, contract. yes. The rest of his contract is nearly all signing bonuses. I think he makes two million in base salary the last three years, but it's it's a lot of signing bonus money. I don't think he's going to walk away from that. Um, I think the most likely scenario at this point is if he does have another knee surgery, then his career is over. He goes on long term uh, injured reserve, and he gets his paycheck. And the Canadian the insurance policy the Canes I'm sure have on his contract pays him, and life goes on. But uh, uh, no, I, I hope for Carey Price. I wish him all the best moving forward because uh, it's been a rough time for him. And the thing we forget, too, is, you know, I'm in my, my late 50s. I still have my career going uh, ahead of me. Uh, uh, these guys, they're so young when it comes to an end. And there's a lot of life left after their NHL playing career. Yeah. And it's a, it's a tough adjustment going from the lifestyle they lead and the money they make and everything else. To all of a sudden, it's over. And when it ends, it ends quickly. So I wish Carey all the best moving forward, whatever happens with him. Stu, uh, when you think of it, 15 years as the goalie of the Montreal Canadiens. That's like a 25-year career somewhere else, maybe more. I mean, I can't imagine the amount of pressure that he's in day in, day out, the scrutiny, the fan base, jerks like myself, (laughs) things he's got to read in the paper and on social media and stuff like that. Um, You know, he's got the highest pressure job of any player in the National Hockey League. And, you know, if he wouldn't want to play anymore, and I don't know if he does or if he doesn't, okay? But let's just say if he wouldn't, because he he talked yesterday about being home, how much more of an appreciation he has for his family and life in general. And it does play itself out on long-term injury reserve. And knowing where the Canadians are in this juncture, and knowing where they want to go, it probably would be kind of like a fitting way to end things where it's kind of like good for everybody. You understand what I'm getting at? I, I do. I do. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, you know, Carrie would still collect the rest of his money. He, he can move on, as he mentioned yesterday, you know, spending so much time with his family. You realize the, how important family is and, and the priority that has to be. Uh, you know, when he came here, you had to talk about the spotlight he was under for 15 years. He came here from the middle of nowhere in BC, little tiny village, and thrown into the spotlight here. In hindsight, I'm surprised Bob Ganey, the GM at the time, didn't have him live with another player or live with him or live with somebody. Uh, you know, he had he had some growing pains off the ice and on the ice. I think that was a mistake, by the way, and I thought oh, it was a mistake when it happened. I don't understand why he wasn't living with Ganey, like sort of what Mario Lemieux did with Sidney Crosby. They basically Gallagher. Brought- Gallagher lived with Georges, and look That's at right. the, look at the professional Gallagher turned out to be. With all due respect to Price, but um, Gallagher is just he's impeccable. Well, and, and Kerry came here. I said from the middle of nowhere in BC, and all yeah. of a sudden in the big city, a big, good-looking kid with money and fame, and the women are pulling him one way, and guys are pulling him another way, and everybody wants a piece of him, and I, he wasn't. I don't think he wasn't ready. I mean, what 18-year-old or 19-year-old is ready for that? Never mind a guy who came from such a little small community. And um, he's grown up in front of our eyes, yeah. all the good and the bad we've seen. Um, you know, now he's a father. He, he's got three kids. His, his priorities are, are different. Yeah. 
But I mean, the pressure he went through, I still remember a few years ago, that interview when he said he felt like he couldn't even go out for groceries just because of the, the scrutiny and the spotlight on him. Yeah. Like, man, playing for the Canadians. And I, I asked this question yesterday to Suzuki and Caulfield, you know, everywhere they go, they're recognized everywhere they go. And yeah, it, it's, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy, no. for, especially for a young kid. Suzuki and, and Caulfield seem to have handled it really, really well. Um, and, you know, Suzuki said, you just got to embrace it and, and realize how much passion there is yeah. in the city and this province for the Canadians. But it's, it was a, it was a difficult adjustment to life in Montreal for Carrie yeah. Price. And as I said, we've watched him grow up in front of our eyes to who he is now with his wife and his three kids who were there watching him play the other yeah. day. You know, Stu, it wasn't easy for me either growing up here, 17, 18, 19, the brown curly hair, the bluish green eyes, woman <laughs> pulling me from everywhere too. I, I had a hard time really trying to deal with it. Well, Tony, believe it or not, I used to have long blonde hair, but when I went out on a Friday night, I ran wow. out of money by about midnight, so I had to go home. <laughs> and NHL players don't run out of money. And they can't, half the time they can't even buy a drink because everybody wants to buy it for them. All right, okay, back to the questions we go. We're having fun. I'm brunching with Marinero. Uh, let's go. Uh, the sensational uh, void says, "Hey Tony, is this the end for Kerry? Do you think he deserves to have his number retired? No cups, obviously, but has any goalie worked harder and saved our behinds more than he has over the years?" Okay. Whew. Because I, you, you know, I have to answer this. I'm going to answer it. I'm not going to lose sleep if they retire his jersey. The amount of games played is there. The amount of wins is there. The average or the numbers on average in terms of save percentage and goals against average is there. The longevity is there. And I realized they never really surrounded him with the exception of one or two years with a team that can go very far. I realize all of that. Having said that, for me, there were too many ups and downs, not enough consistency. He was stellar one year, very, very good for a couple of years, but there were too many lows. There were a lot of losses. There were obviously no Stanley Cups, uh, which is no fault of his own. If they would have won the Cup last year, it would have been a lot easier, Stu, to say you could retire his number because for them to win it, Carey Price would have had to steal it from Tampa. I'm going to go with no to his number to be retired, I will go to yes to honor him in the, uh, what is it called? The ring of or right. uh, honor, I think it is, yeah. The, the ring of honor or whatever it is. Uh, but I'm not going to lose any sleep should they retire his number. Your thoughts? I agree with you, Tony, because if you're going to retire Kerry's number, you got to look back. Steve Shutt tied for the team record for most goals in a season. A lot of Stanley Cups, his number's not retired. Jacques Lemaire's number's not retired. Um, but I understand the younger generation of Habs fans who would want Carey's number retired, who would want Saku Koivu's number retired. When I grew up, there was so many stars in the Canadians. Larry Robinson, Serge Savard, Ken Dryden, Guy Lafleur. There, it goes on and on. Guy Lapointe. Well, Guy Lapointe well, Point was my favorite player. And yeah. He wasn't the best player on the team. I love Guy Lapointe. He's a Hall of Famer. His number is yeah. retired. Uh, but the younger generation have, have never had that. They, the only two guys they've really had – that were legitimate, I guess, you know, even to consider for that are Saku Koivu and Carey Price. Never, neither of them, I mean, Saku, I don't think ever won an individual award. Um, he won the Masterton one year, I guess, when he came back. He did. Um, he won the Masterton, yeah. 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 Carey Price, you know, won the Vez, won everything except the Stanley Cup. But the standard, if Carey was playing for any other team in the NHL, it's a no-brainer. Okay, he's going to get his number retired. But when you look at the standard set for the Canadians for numbers retired and some of the guys whose numbers aren't retired yeah. from the glory years. Um, I think it'd be hard to retire Carey Price's number, I but I agree. Really him and would deserve to be in that ring of honor yeah. uh, at the Bell Center. And, and I understand why young fans yeah. would believe that their numbers should be retired because they were their heroes. They're, they're the only two yeah. really Habs heroes the younger generation of Habs fans have had. I think that's a good way of uh, putting it, Stu. He probably plays for any other team in the National Hockey League. And he has his number retired, but Montreal is a different standard. All right, uh, Jeff Petrie, let's get to the audio now. We know that uh, in the middle of December, he asked for a trade because of a family situation that his family was finding living in Quebec, especially with, with the pandemic was very difficult. They went back to Michigan. Uh, Kent Hughes admitted that, you know, uh, they were trying to move Jeff Petrie at his request 
but we're only going to do so if it made sense for both parties. Petrie played really well down the stretch, uh, and he was asked if by any chance there could be a change of heart, and he left the door open. Listen carefully. You know, for me right now is, um, you know, going to take some time, um, just reflect on the year, uh, get back to my family, um, you know, have a have a long conversation with them, um, you know, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to close the door on uh, on this organization or this team um, right now. So, you know, just to some, take some time um, and reflect and, um, you know, decide what the what the best decision would be for for myself my family and this team all right sporting an mtl cap the way you saw him Stu, uh, i was convinced i think i almost guaranteed that um jeff petrie would not play a game for the montreal canadians next season and would be dealt in the off season but kent hughes admitted yesterday hey if you think i'm gonna take three rookies and have them in the lineup on defense at the same time you're mistaken I want my young defensemen to develop. And if some of them are going to be here with the NHL team, they're going to have to be insulated with some veterans and some older players on defense so that they can develop properly and we don't burn them. And if we trade Jeff Petrie, we're going to go out and try and replace Jeff Petrie. So with that said, if Petrie goes back to Kent Hughes and says, hey, listen, I spoke with my family and we've decided to stay in Montreal after all, probably going to keep him. Yeah, I'm going to defend Jeff Petrie here, Tony. He's taken a lot of heat this season. I've, I've dealt with, before COVID came, I dealt with Jeff a lot in the locker room and that. I really liked him. I've written before. He, he came across to me as the kind of guy you'd want your daughter to marry. Soft-smoking, smart, thoughtful, humble. you got to remember, he's the son of a Major League Baseball pitcher. Yes. Uh, he grew up, you know, a humble guy, uh, Smart, soft-spoken, like I said. And when he was speaking out about Dominic Ducharme's system earlier in the season, I wrote a couple of times. We didn't, have, you know, we don't didn't have access to the guys this season. I couldn't pull Jeff aside and ask him, like, "Are you speaking for the whole team, or what's going on here?" But that's what I thought. I thought he was speaking up as a veteran because everybody in the locker room was frustrated with Ducharme's system and the fact he wouldn't change it when it wasn't working. And I asked Petrie about it yesterday, and that's what he said. You know, I was hearing what was going on in the room. Guys weren't happy. You wouldn't change the system even though it wasn't working. And I was speaking up hoping to help the team. And that's what I thought. Just By the way, Stu, if I can, for one second, yeah. okay, because for all of you and everyone out there that took it with us, members of the media, saying you're making something out of nothing when Petrie called out the structure or lack thereof, folks – we don't just do what we do and not have people whisper in our ears and not have players whisper in our ears. You get it that some of our opinions are formulated on the fact that players are telling us stuff, okay? We knew when it was said that Petrie was calling out Ducharme. Petrie was upset with Ducharme. The team did not like the system they were playing. And Petrie yesterday, because sometimes players can admit it, sometimes they don't. Petrie yesterday admitted that the Canadians' system wasn't working. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result than they were getting. And he said there was no adjustment made to that. And it was very frustrating. So... Please don't say that we make something out of nothing. We know he, what we're doing. He also mentioned how much they missed uh, Philip Deneau and how much that hurt the system that they had wanted to play. But this wasn't a case of Petrie whispering in my ear because we had no access to the players since COVID. This was a case of me getting to know Jeff a little bit in the locker room the previous seasons he was here and just realized it was very unlike him to speak so publicly against the coach's system. It was unlike him. It's, it's, it's not in his character. But he was speaking up for all the other guys in the room. And I'm sure when he was saying it, the other guys in the room were like, Thank thankfully somebody's letting the fans and everybody know like what the, the issue is here. And you gotta remember too, with Jeff Petrie talking about he had that, the COVID restrictions, he spoke about this yesterday. He's got three young boys at home and his household is you know, you have two boys, you know how crazy a household could be. Yeah. The fact of the COVID restrictions, his family and his wife's family couldn't come here to help them out 
with the kids or whatever. They couldn't go there. His wife got frustrated with all the COVID restrictions. She had a bad experience in a Costco language related. And it was just everything piled on and they had enough. But this is a guy and a family who twice, he was an unrestricted free agent. He never even tested the market. They wanted to stay in Montreal. They never tested the market. At a time when free agents didn't want to come here, he was a guy who liked it here. His family lived on the South Shore. They moved, I think it was like last year or the year before, they moved the downtown to the downtown area. From Candiac to Westmount. They really liked it. They had their kids put into a good school or preschool. Like everything was, they, they were happy here. They liked living in yeah. Montreal. And he mentioned it yesterday. And Jeff Petrie isn't a liar. Like he, he, he spoke yesterday about how much, and now everything's changed. The his, wife has, his wife is best friends with Carrie Price's wife. The coach has changed. The COVID restrictions are down. Um, they've had a time to step back. And as he said, he's going to go home and sort of take in everything that's happened this season. And I, I believe that if I think he might go to Ken Hughes and say, look, if you want to trade, I understand. You know, I asked for a trade. It was me who put it out there. But I'd really like to stay here if you guys want to still want to have me. And I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. And 6.25 for the next three years, it's not the end of the world. It's not. And you got, as I said earlier, you know, these guys are also humans and everything that was going on, he was living at home as he wasn't with his wife and his kids. And as I mentioned earlier, he's, he's always struck me as a guy you'd want your daughter to marry. And just seeing him before COVID interacting with his three boys outside the Canadians locker room uh, when they were doing their stretching and the boys were right in there. And there's been a lot of videos on uh, the Canadians Twitter account and YouTube of him at home. And he just seems like yeah. a guy who it, I'm sure it was imagine you, Tony, being your, doesn't matter how much money you make. You're away from your wife. You're away from your kids. It's not easy. And this was just a really difficult season for Jeff Petrie. And I think he's going to take some time now and step back. But I wouldn't be surprised if he goes to Kent Hughes and says, look, if you guys want to keep me, I want to be here. And I'm going to be the best player I can be for this franchise moving forward. Yeah. Listen, either way it goes, it wouldn't surprise me. Back to the questions we go. Uh, morning. Uh, hey, Tony from Rockland, Ontario. I'm a Montrealer. If the Habs get first overall, would you consider trading the pick? for a star player if you were the GM. Long story short, Stu, if they get first overall, would you trade it for Alexi Lafreniere? I would definitely. Yes, yes I would. Definitely, I would. yes, you would. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well listen, um, it would reinvigorate the fan base. I mean, you know, at a time where, you know, they used to be the flying Frenchman. Can you imagine having a Lafreniere on a first line? I think it's something that they would look at, and I think it's something that they would definitely consider. You're getting a 20 year old kid with two years of experience in the NHL. I think he had 19 goals this season, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, not playing on the number one liner that um, there would be a lot of pressure for Lafreniere coming here. But, um, you know, there's no, you know, Shane Wright is like, I, I, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on Shane Wright. I've seen the guy play a couple of times on TV. That's it. I don't know how good he is or what his weaknesses are or whatever. I just know what I read from people who do that for a living following these guys. But, Alexis Lafreniere, there was no doubt that he was the number one pick coming into that year's draft. He's played two years in the NHL. He's a big guy. He's big, strong. Um, yeah, I would, I would do it. All right, okay. Uh, should be noted that the NF the NHL draft lottery will go on Tuesday, May 10th. You know what May 10th is, eh? What's that? It's the anniversary of Gila Fleur's goal versus the Bruins in Game 7 uh -huh. in the playoffs, 1979. On May 10th? Yeah. After, you know they scored ten, after they scored 10 goals in the final game of the regular season. There's a lot of weird stuff going on, man. You know what year LaFleur was born, eh? Uh, I need to do the math. 51. Right. You know what number Shane Wright wears? 51. 51. Hey, maybe. Who knows? It's all coming together, or maybe we're just thinking too much here. All right. I, having said this about Lafreniere, I, don't, I don't know if the Rangers would make that trade. Uh, one, yeah, that's, the Rangers would. That, that's a good question. All right, okay. Back to the questions. Uh, Robert. Hey, Tony, Mark Bergerman gets all the blame for the bad contracts that Habs currently have. However, I lay the blame equally on Jeff Molson and company. Doesn't Molson sign off on contracts? Yes, he does. But at the same time, I mean, if you hire a general manager and you're not going to allow him to do what he wants to, like, hold on a second. I understand the comment, but I'm Jeff Molson. I hire Stu Cowan as my GM. He's the hockey guy. And, I mean, I watched the game growing up. I know a little bit about it. But, obviously, I'm not qualified to be a GM. That's why I'm hiring Stu Cowan. Stu says to me, I'm going to give Carey Price this contract. I'm going to give Brendan Gallagher this contract. I'm the owner. I hired him. He's my GM. I'm going to tell him, no, you can't do that? Well, then Stu's going to say, well, then I can't be your general manager. I, I mean, come on. You can't do that. 
No, well, the good thing now, Tony, is at least there's somebody between the GM and Jeff Molson. Correct. I mean, Jeff Molson had no qualifications to be the what well, basically he was the director of hockey operations, right? Before they brought in Jeff Gordon. I mean, you know, ever played in the NHL, he's a businessman, right? He was born into a family, runs a Molson brewery, and he had money to buy the team. That's yeah, the qualifications he has. Now, with Jeff Gordon, now with now be Kent Hughes, if he wants to sign whoever to a contract, he's gonna go to Jeff Gordon and say, What do you think? And he's gonna get that so they can bounce stuff off yeah. each other and then Jeff Gordon goes to Jeff Molson, and the only question for Jeff Molson is, are you willing to spend this much money on the player? That's the only – that's you – know, yeah. and if Molson's – if he's telling them, spend to the cap, do whatever you want, which was what he should do as an owner, as an owner you, hire the, you hire smart people and you let them do their job, and that's yeah. what's happening. Finally now, that's what's happening with the Canes. They've hired really smart people in Gordon, Hughes, and St. Louis, and Jeff Molson just put his feet up on his desk and let them do their work. And have the, if you have any problems you need me to deal with, come yeah. let me know. Otherwise, you guys are in charge. I think the two-headed monster and hiring Gordon, who hired Hughes, is as probably the, the most brilliant thing that Jeff Molson's ever done, uh, besides buying the Montreal Canadiens at like $575 million, whatever <laughs> well, it was, with the building and event included, and now it's worth $1.45 billion or something like that. But Gordon and Hughes are, are good friends also, and that's a key, Tony, because you and I are like buddies, right? If we, if we were yeah. running the Canadiens... I'd bounce ideas off you. You'd bounce off ideas off me. You could tell me, Stu, you're an idiot. That makes no sense. Yeah. Or vice. I'm going to respect you. That's the that's the the relationship yeah. these guys have. They're both smart hockey guys. One guy from an agent background. One guy from a management background. Look at what Gordon was able to do in Boston and New York. He has a track record that shows he can rebuild a team. And they can they can talk. And St. Louis, three of them are buddies, so they can sit in a room, have a beer or whatever, and bounce ideas and say you're an idiot. That makes no sense. But they're the, no hard feelings because they respect each other and they respect their opinions and they can talk to each other as friends and disagree with each other. And then at the end of the day, Jeff Gordon is the director of hockey operations. He'll have the final say on what happens. By the way, Stu, uh, if you ever get a job in the National Hockey League, I appreciate that we're buddies. But you know what? Uh, don't think of me, OK, because, <laughs> you know, I, I'm used to three, four hour days. Max, I, I, I don't want to work 14 hour days. Not interested. All you right. can't afford the pay cut either, right, Tony? Yeah, probably not. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, uh, back to the questions. Jani Potesta, based on how the team is trending, where do you see the Habs finishing next season? Um, I, I fear they're going to finish um, 20th. I want them to finish 32nd. No, I fear they're going to finish 24th, but I want them to finish 32nd. Yeah, they're going to finish in the bottom five or so i would say i mean it's it, and it's hard to say i mean even can you said yesterday like you know if carry price is done and that's 10.5 million off your cap if they trade shea weber's contract if you know if they were yeah. able to move Petrie or gallery too early to say too early to say yeah it's too early to say i mean and even marty st louis we asked them the other day you know are your are your concepts going to be the same next season as they were this season you know this season he talked about how it wasn't that important winning games it was more important to develop guys etc etc he's you know he's asked is that going to be the same thing next year he's like, i can't tell you because i don't know what the team's going to look like next year if it's a young team again which is young kids that yes that will be that it'll be development but yeah if there's all kinds of guys leave and and hughes goes out and brings in two or three new free agents and uh you know if carrie price is is really healthy and can play. It seems unlikely, but we don't know who the goalie is going to be next season. We don't know who the captain is going to be next season. We don't know who's going to be here, who's not going to be here. Uh, so it's hard to say right now, but, but it, it'd be hard to imagine. Like I can't, they're not going to even can't use it. No, we're not. It's not like we're going to contend for the Stanley cup next year. Yeah. But that, I think they're going to be a bottom five, bottom 10 team. in the NHL. I'll, I'll go with the opinion that I always have. If you're not going to make the playoffs, you might as well finish last. All right. Okay. Next. Mike, will Kent Hughes be looking for another goalie? Uh, Jake Allen will not be able to take all the weight. So if Carey Price cannot come back, yes, he will. Because Jake Allen, uh, it was too much of a workload for him. Even his agent admitted it. Next. Eric, do you think the Habs are going to build, do a real rebuild? Or is Hughes going to use the last game to avoid the rebuild and then continue Mark Bergevin's famous reset every year? He's not going to do a reset, but I think he's going to do a revamp. Hey, Stu? Yeah, whatever the try. I mean, Ken Hughes has said this. Choose whatever word you want. Rebuild. Yeah. Reset. The thing is, they're already ahead of the curve if it is a rebuild because they already have Cole Caulfield. They already have Nick Suzuki. They already have Alexander Romanov. They have a lot of young talent here. They already have uh, uh, Jordan Harris. Uh, Goulet is probably going to be here next year. They have a lot of 
good young players in the system already. So it's not like they're blowing up and starting from scratch. If you want to call it a rebuild, they've already started that process. There's already there's a lot of good young talent here, so it's not like they're starting from scratch. So I, people get hung up on is it a rebuild, is it a reset? Call it whatever you want. I mean, they're, yeah. they're they're trying to build a better hockey team. And as Ken, you said, his goal is to build a team that's going to win consistently year after year with a chance to win the Stanley Cup. All right, okay. Um, Brendan Gallagher was asked about uh, his season and uh, talked about concerns that the fans have regarding his play. Let's hear from him. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I signed here uh, for six years because I love this city. I love this team. Obviously, this year was, um, you know, it was very frustrating. It was it was tough to go through uh, on a lot of different levels. Uh, but that doesn't change a lot of things. It doesn't change my... You know, my, my desire to be a Montreal Canadian, my want to be a, a winner here. And, um, you know, f being where we were two seasons ago to being where we are now, it was, uh, uh, you know, obviously nobody saw it coming, but it doesn't change, uh, you know, what I want in, in, in my future here. And obviously uh, being a Montreal Canadian is part of that. All right. There's Brendan Gallagher being a Montreal Canadian is part of it. And he understands some concerns, but he believes that with the proper rest, he said when he's going to meet with his doctors here at the end of the season, uh, his medical file is going to be a long one, but um, with a little bit of R and R, and then get back to specific training uh, once he's uh, re-energized, he believes he'll be able to bounce back next season. I wrote a column a few months ago saying I'm not ready to give up on Brendan Gallagher, but if I was able to trade the rest of his contract, I would. So I'm not not willing to give up on him, but I'm not willing to bet 100 percent that he's going to be able to come back. Um, is he going to be a 30 goal scorer again? Not with the Canadians because he's not going to be on the number one line. That's going to be uh, Cole Caulfield and Suzuki and whoever else is there. Can he be a 20 goal scorer again? I believe he can be. Yes. Uh, can And the thing with Brandon Gallagher, you're going to get everything he has every shift, just like he's played his whole career. As he said, you know, I didn't get to the NHL because I'm an elite talent. I got there because I work hard and I go to dirty areas and I pay the price to score goals and his body's taking the toll because of the way he played. But he's a, he's a, a, a Jim Nutt is that his dad's going to train him all summer. Uh, he talked about how, you know, he's going to, his, his medical meeting yesterday was going to be a long one. He said basically everything around his pelvis area was hurting. He played through a groin injury in the Stanley Cup final, the, the playoffs the year before. He's been really banged up. He hasn't had time to get his body back in shape. Uh, he turned down an offer to play for Team Canada at the World Championships because he wants to just focus on training and getting ready for next season. I believe he's going to come into the next season at training camp. He's going to be 100% healthy he's going to give 100 percent every time he's on the ice and i believe he can score 20 goals gallagher said the team needs a captain cole caulfield said he sees suzuki as a captain Stu, can this whole captaincy issue be a little bit of a distraction if it's named by management and or the coach should they go back to a player's vote again and ultimately who do you think is going to be that captain I think management's going to name the captain, and I think they're leaning towards naming Nick Suzuki captain. But I also think they're taking into consideration that next year is the first season of Suzuki's huge contract. And if he gets off to a slow start, he had a bit of a slow start this season, and it's going to be the contract, the captain seems to be a lot of weight on his shoulders. Suzuki's a mature young guy. He's uh, 21, I believe. He, I, I think he can handle it. 22. But 22, but I think the Canadians' management is just, they're not certain. Um, you, know, I, you look at Brendan Gallagher after the final game, you know, he was the guy who got all the players together to go to the corner, and or sorry, the game after Guy Lafleur died and raised their sticks up to the Lafleur banner. It was Gallagher who took the microphone to talk to the fans after the final game of the regular season. It looks like Gallagher's going to stay here. I don't think they're going to trade him during the offseason. So I, I can see Brendan Gallagher being the captain next season. Yeah. Uh, listen, he's awesome. Um, I'm not so sure I want that for him because a, he doesn't quite have the respect of the officials. Doesn't really get the benefit of the doubt with them. B and in no particular order. Um, the fact that he wasn't able to put up offensive numbers really bothered him. And if I, if you couple that with being the captain and all the speaking and all the responsibilities, it may be a little bit too much for him. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I really wouldn't have a problem with it. I think, I would like, I think Joel Edmondson would be a great captain for two years. He's got two years left on his contract. Um, he's a stay at home defenseman. Um, 
And so there wouldn't be expectations to put up numbers. He could be the captain in transition. And then you give it to Suzuki a couple of years from now. Uh, who knows if Brendan Gallagher gets traded at some point. So anyway, look, I don't have a problem with who's going to be the captain. I personally would make Edmondson the captain for a couple of years and then make Suzuki the captain if they don't have another captain that comes along. Jonathan Drew the, the pre- Sorry, the pressure of being captain would be no bother whatsoever for Brendan because he's been around here for so long. He knows everything that goes on in the Montreal market. He's fantastic dealing with the media. He always yes, has. He has. Never, and going back, when, when they named Shea Weber the captain, before that I wrote a column saying I think Brendan Gallagher should be the captain instead of Shea Weber because – Gallagher does do all the other stuff apart from in the locker room that comes with being captain of the Canadians, which is different than being captain of the Nashville Predators, as we spoke about earlier. I would have named Gallagher the captain and let him deal with the media and all the other stuff that comes with, with being the captain and just let Shea Weber be the leader in the locker room. And I think that would have been a, a – we, we might not be in the situation we are right now with Shea Weber. But uh, Brendan Gallagher, if they do choose Brendan Gallagher, great pick. He'll be ready for it. And if they choose Nick Suzuki – Good pick also. I think uh, after looking towards the future, I think Nick Suzuki's a guy who's going to be here for a long term. Uh, captain with Gallagher and Edmondson to help him along. Uh, uh, either way, I'm fine with what they do. Jonathan Drouin said that, um, you know, he held off on, um, on taking himself out of the lineup because he really wanted to impress the new management team and the coach wanted to play for the coach uh, in, you know, uh, who gives you freedom to play and stuff like that. So he wants to play for Marty St. Louis. I think you and I agree though, that unless something absolutely spectacular happens with Jonathan Drouin next season, that you and I think that he's a guy that'll be dealt before the deadline. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, unless Jonathan Drouin somehow scores 35 goals and gets 90 points or something next season, uh, they'll be moving him. And even if he does have a good season, they probably still will move him because then they'll get more for him than they would uh, if he has a bad year. So I think this is going to be Jonathan Joy's final season. To defend Jonathan Joy, he played. He, he was okay this season when he was healthy. I mean, he was one of the few players in the Canadians who was, you know, putting up points and 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 doing okay. I think he was leading the team in scoring when he got uh, went out of the lineup for the first time. But going tonight, it's a contract year for him. He's going to play with a coach who plays the style of hockey he wants to play, which Jonathan spoke about yesterday. He should be healthy. If he doesn't produce next season, no, he's never going to produce. No. All right. Okay. Back to the questions. Marvin, a lot of excitement over the potential of young players like Suzuki and Caulfield, who in your estimation would be the next young player that fans should be excited about. Jordan Harris, I think from what we saw about him, uh, you know, Gouley will probably make the team next year, I think, but he's more of a stay at home type defenseman, a uh, younger version of Shea Weber, which people have uh, who watched him play junior more than me have, have compared him to. Um, but Jordan Harris is, is a, you know, the confidence he's played with the puck, the way he can move the puck and skate with the puck. Uh, he's going to be a lot of fun to watch for, for a long time. He's a really smart kid. Yeah. He's a lot of fun to interview. He's going to be interesting to, to speak with him moving forward. So yeah, I, I'm excited to watch Jordan Harris and what he can do moving forward. I'm going to go with Romanov. I think he has two, maybe three other levels that he can get to by the time he really gets into the peak of his career. Let's not forget, still relatively young and early on in his career. Uh, I think he made huge progress, especially in the last two months of the season. So I think Romanov still has a couple of levels that he can get to. Well, after Cole Caulfield's second half of the season with Marty St. Louis, to me, Romanov was the story of this season. He, he's yeah. just, he improved so much. He had so much ice time, which is going to help him moving forward. He spoke yesterday about how much he loves being in Montreal, loves playing in Montreal. This kid's going to be a really good defenseman for a long time. All right, more questions. Probably give or take five minutes left uh, on this brunching with Marinaro. LJ Lafleur, uh, Tony and Stu, Toronto gave away a first-round pick a few years ago in order to get Carolina to take Patrick Marlowe's contract off their hands. Do you think the Habs would be willing to do the same in order to get out of Weber's prices or Gallagher's? No, I mean, Weber's not playing again, so it's either... Although, and Ken, you spoke about this yesterday, there's insurance issues and there's NHL issues involved. And the NHL issue is... The NHL, I don't believe, has signed off on Shea Weber just staying on long-term injured reserve until the end of this contract. That's something... That's a big reason why I think Hughes wasn't able to deal the contract to Arizona before the trade deadline, and Arizona took on Little's contract instead, which isn't as advantageous to the salary cap as Weber's contract would have been. Um, 
and same with Price. Price is either going to go on long-term injured reserve or he's going to stay with the Canadians. He's not going to retire. And, and with Gallagher, Hughes basically said yesterday that Gallagher's going to be here. I mean, I don't think there's a market right now with his health and the contract. And as he said, he's just hoping Gallagher can bounce back next year and have a good season. And that's what Gallagher's hoping for also. Next. Curtis, does Pierre-Luc Dubois make sense to pursue this summer considering the issues in Winnipeg with uh, Anaida speeding up the rebuild? Uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois, uh, center slash winger, still relatively young, um, set to become an unrestricted free agent in a couple of years from now. So he becomes an RFA this summer and uh, they can't come to terms on a contract in Winnipeg, it appears. So before they get to him going into the final year of his contract and then maybe losing him eventually for nothing, they may look to trade him. No, I'd be interested in him. But again, so much as Ken Hughes said yesterday, so much of the salary cap situation is tied into what happens with Price, what happens with Weber, what happens with Petrie. No. Could you imagine uh, Suzuki and Pierre-Luc Dubois at center if you can pull it off? Oh, yeah. yeah. That'd be pretty good. Yeah. But then again, and you could have Suzuki uh, and Shane Wright possibly if you get the first pick overall. And you won't have to give up anything for Shane Wright. As for Pierre-Luc Dubois, you'd probably have to give away several pieces. Yeah, but you know what you're getting in Pierre-Luc Dubois, and you don't know what you're getting in Shane Wright. The NHL draft is a crapshoot. I don't care. Look look through the history of the NHL draft and how many of the top 20 picks are that you've never heard of. I mean, yeah. It's a crapshoot. You're drafting 18-year-old yeah, kids point. trying to predict how they're going to become men in the NHL. Some can do it, and, and more, more can't do it than can do it. All right, back to the questions. David, you think Montembeau can be a consistent backup goalie to Allen? Why go out and find another goalie if we are not contending next season? So you just said it. If they choose not to be a contender, yes. If they choose to be a contender, no. Would you agree with those answers, too? Yeah, it's, I, I don't think Montembeau is going to be back with the Canadians. Um, I don't know if there's interest in another NHL team that might want to sign him. If not, maybe the Canadians sign him and think about him and uh, Primo and Laval next season. Uh, calling Montembeau up if there's an injury to Allen or whatever, but I don't think Montembeau is going to be one of the two goalies with the Canadians to start next season. Next. Danny De Rosier. Tony, what free agents should Montreal search for this summer? Should we consider bringing back to Foley? You're talking to the wrong guy uh, because, by the way, to Foley still has time left on his contract, so he's not going to be a free agent, right? Yeah, that, that was one of the reasons that Calgary and I got him. Yeah, so... Our you know, you're talking to a guy that wants a rebuild because I absolutely want I absolutely want Connor Bedard, so I'm not going after any free agent. Next. Uh, and if I can't have Connor Bedard, I'll take Michkov. And if I can't have Michkov, I'll take Fantilli. Uh, so I want to tank next year. Uh, Gaetan B, if Price and Petrie come back, who's leaving? Well, I guess you're talking from a salary cap perspective. Uh Nobody. I mean, they're going to try and maybe move guys. Who are you going to move? I mean, they, as I mentioned before, I don't think you can trade Gallagher in his contract at this point. And, uh, you know, who else are you going to try and move to free up space? All right. Uh, maybe Armia. Uh, well, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think, I think the NHL now knows what Yola Armia is. I, I, I would think so. At that contract, by the way, nobody's taken with that contract. At all. Josh Anderson at that contract has to produce more. I understand yeah. he yes. plays a certain brand of hockey that numbers don't say everything, but at the end of the day, numbers got to say something. His numbers are not good enough for a player that makes that money on that term. He's got to be more consistent. I mean, there's games you look at him and he's dominant out there, and there's other games you don't notice him. He's just he's got to be a lot more. And there's too yeah. many games you don't notice him. He's got to be more consistent. This is why I say that uh, people who are very consistent at their jobs and bring it every single day, those are the people that should be paid millions. Well, that's why that's why <clears throat> Brandon Gallagher's making the money he's making, Tony. He, <clears throat> he, he he brings it every he brings it every yeah. day, just like you do. <laughs> I didn't say it, Stu. But you did. All right, okay. Uh, two more, two more questions, uh, Davis. Should the Canadians go for a position in need of best player available if Wright is off the board at number one? Best. Uh, so in need or best player available? Best player available. Always. They went by position. They ended up with Jesperi Kotkaniemi instead of Kachuk. Always. When they went for the best player, they ended up with Cole Caulfield. Yeah, and you know what? 
uh, if you draft the best player available, but you don't need that particular position, you can always take one of the players that you drafted at the best player available and trade for a player who plays the position that you need. You're always better off best player available. Last, uh, Lastly, here we go. Mike, great show, Tony and Stu. The torch was passed uh, to Richard, to Bellafold, to Lafleur with a great tradition of excellence. Do you think there is someone who deserves to carry this torch going forward? Well, there's not going to be anybody I can't see at that level moving forward. I mean, it was a different era, a different time. Uh, you know, the Francophone connection, these guys were larger than life. Uh, but Nick Suzuki is the guy who, moving forward at this point, is going to be the guy carrying the Canadian torch. If you love this podcast, comment sick, S-I-C-K, do so on all social media platforms. We actually go ahead and we count the amount of people who comment sick. So then we know there's at least that amount of people that love this podcast. So make yourselves heard. Stu, in ending, uh, Guy Lafleur is um, going to be exposed today at the Bell Center and tomorrow. Uh, I, and the funeral will be at Mary Queen of the World Cathedral on Tuesday. Uh, I would imagine you're going. I'm headed to the Bell Center as soon as we finish the show here, and I will be at the funeral on Tuesday, and my condolences again to Guy and his friends and his family. And Rest in peace, Guy. There'll never be another one like you. Uh, I will be going tomorrow, and uh, I'll see you at the funeral on Tuesday. And you're right, Stu. There will never, ever be another Guy Lafleur. We love you, Guy. Thoughts and prayers to his family. It's the Sick Podcast. Have a good Sunday, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Stu. You're my, my pleasure, Tony. Fall. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by 8.6, Intense by Nature.